Okay, this is chapter 11, interest group, video lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to, or by the end of this lecture, you should be able to answer the following learning objectives, um, distinguishing the essential differences between interest groups and political parties, understanding the three basic theories of interest, groups, um, interest group politics, determine the factors that tend to make interest groups successful, differentiate between the potential group and actual group, and determine how the free rider problem applies to those. You'll explain how interest groups try to shape public policy and how lobbyists represent interest groups and influence the legislative agenda, describe various types of interest groups, explain why authors of the textbook say that problems of honest lobbying now appear to outweigh the traditional problems of dishonest lobbying, summarize implications of the size of governments that are generated by the power of PACs and special interest groups, and lastly, analyze the appropriate role of interest groups within a democratic environment. All right, so the role of interest groups. First, let's define what an interest group is. Um, an interest group is an organization of people with a shared policy goal, entering the policy process to at several points to try to achieve these goals. So people come together, they believe in a shared policy, and they want to proceed getting that policy passed at different points in our government, either a state, local, or federal government, um, to make sure, that, or even other ways, um, to achieve this goal. So that's what an interest group is. So what's the difference between an interest group and political parties? Um, well, first off, interest groups, they don't run their own slate of candidates. Um, in some other countries with multi-party systems, um, political part political parties. Sometimes these interest groups prim, um, become a political party themselves and then run for office for different um, different positions in government. So an interest group doesn't have their own candidates. Um, they are just they just they believe in a, they have a belief in a, in a certain policy and that's it. Um, so that's one difference. Second difference is they're specialists, policy specialists. Um, they have a, they, they, whatever that policy, whatever that shared, um, policy that these people, this group of people have in common, they specialize in, they know every, they know all the pros and cons of it, where a political party, um, they're very general in what they believe in, and they, um, they, uh, represent a large, a large, um, group of policies, not just one, maybe one or two policies, but they, you know, they, they would they cover the gamut from social economics, um, where a, an interest group may be very it's very specialized. Like the NRA is a great example. They're a, they're all about gun rights. That's it. They specialize in gun rights, making sure they're protected from people. Where a, a Republican would would be for gun rights, but also they would be also um, um, for different issues like abortion. They have a different stance. They would have a different stance on taxes and size of government. So they're more broad in general. And the third difference between a interest group and political parties is interest groups don't have to appeal to everyone to get elected or to get something done. Um, interest groups are just trying, all they need to do is influence enough members of Congress or, or the president or or judges or what, how, whatever it may be they're trying to influence to get something, um, get a policy passed in their favor. Or a political party, someone running for office, they need to be able to appeal to a large group of people in order to get elected into office. So these are the main differences between interest groups and political parties. Okay, so to understand the debate over whether honest lobbying creates problems for government in America, uh, it requires us to examine uh, three important theories which we talked about before, which were introduced back in Chapter 1, um, the pluralist theory, um, elite theory, and hyperpluralist theory. The pluralist theory argues that interest group activity brings representation to all, and um, according to pluralist groups, compete and counterbalance one another in the political marketplace. In contrast, you got the elite theory, which would argue that a few groups, primarily the wealthy, have most of the power, and therefore that's not necessarily good for it all. And then finally, hyperpluralist theory would say that too many groups are getting too much of what they want, which results in government policy is often contradictory, lacking in direction. And um, and so this this section is going to examine um, 
each of these three theories with respect to interest groups. All right, so let's look at pluralist theory first. Um, okay, they, would, they would say, the pluralist theory would say that some are winning, some of these interest groups are winning and some are losing, but not, but not one group is winning all the time or losing all the time. Um, so a group, in this, in this group theory, which is um, which, which these theories are about these different groups, um, they contain they contain several essential arguments that um, that they're good. Um, for instance, interest groups or groups provide a key link between people and the government, and whereby all legitimate interests in the political systems can be can get a hearing from the government because everyone because these interest groups represent everyone in America. Everyone's getting a fair hearing, which links us to the government. Um, so that's one key argument for it. Um, another one would be groups compete and interests constantly make claims uh, on one another. So, where is it going to be? Oh, so because you got different interest groups like labor, business, farmers, consumers, um, they're all, they're all, they have all these different interests and they're constantly competing for different claims in the government and this kind of goes back to again they represent every they all these different interest groups are representing everyone, which is also linking us to the government. And because there's so many different groups out there, no not one group is going to be dominant over the other. So one group throws its weight around too much, its opponents are going to intensify their their lobbying and efforts to try to gain some more balance to gain balance in the power. And same with like if you think about businesses competing, if one business creates um, Google Plus was like Google Plus. They create they create this new social network, and they have some really cool aspects of it. Facebook is not going to sit by and just let Google Plus take over their market share. They're going to try to fix what they got and make improve their product better, so they're they're still the dominant group or they're they're still competitive. Um, and that's what interest groups do by competing. If the, if one's doing a better job than the other, then the other ones the ones that are lacking are going to try to raise their level so that they can can better compete as well. Um, Another argument for having groups or pluralism is that they play by the rules. Most of the time, they're going to play by the rules. Um, group politics is a fair fight with few groups lying, cheating, stealing, or engaging in violence to get in their way. To get their way. Um, so again, not everyone's going to do. Of course, there are people who are there are interest groups that are not following the rules, and there are members of Congress not following the rules as well. And that's why you have media to try to um, find those scandals. But um, but there's but they they would say that most for the most part they're all playing by the rules, and having groups usually plays. Um, I'm sorry, having groups also is um, weak. If one group is weak in one resource, they can also they can be used. They can use another resource to help them out. Um, so for instance, if a big business, they they're the ones that have money on its side, but labor has mon has numbers numbers of people working for them. They need each other. So all legitimate groups are able to affect public policy by one means or other. So just because business has money, they can't do things without the labor or the people to create their product or make their, their business run. So they need each other in order to be successful. Policies are going to have to um, work for, each, for both groups. So these are arguments for having groups and why um, having groups, having lots of groups, Competing and not in trying and trying to win or lose is a good thing. Then you have the elitist theory, and uh, they would deny and say that pluralism is is a, is really not a good thing. Um, uh, they maintain that real power is held by a rel relatively few people, again mainly the the wealthy people, and that government is is run by a few big interests looking out for themselves. And the, they would point out that interlocking and concentrated power centers. Uh, if you think about it, there are about one third of our of top institutional positions. They're occupied by people who hold more than one such position. Just just because I'm a CEO of a multinational corporation, um, I may also be on a board, like a um, a university, a board of university, a trustee on a university, um, on different foundations, different you know, organizations or foundations and boards as well. And because of that, because people are in these interlocking positions, it concentrates the power into it only a few, and if you look at and some examples of this would be a multinational corporation, um, and they're the ones that are going to be more influential than any other groups out there. So just because the pluralists say there's a bunch of groups out there, that's good, they're competing, 
it doesn't mean nothing because it's an equal balance of power where the wealthier the ones still have more more weight than the other. The, the big interest groups have more weight than the others. And um, it's held by the largest corporations, this power. And this is uh, this power that's held by the largest corporation is fortified by these interlocking directories where, I'm sorry, directorates, where people are on more than one board, their CEOs are more than one, they're a CEO of a corporation, they're on a board of another, and that makes all the that makes all the power concentrated within these few people, like um, banks. Banks would be a you know huge industry or oil industry. These people are on multiple boards, and um, they're the ones controlling a lot more than than the other than the other interest groups, the small fish, per se. Okay, and then the last theory is the hyperpluralism theory, which would argue that pluralist system is out of control. Um, this guy named Theodore Lowy, he coined the phrase interest group liberalism, which uh, refers to the government's excessive differences to groups. It's, he would say that it's the government's job to advance all interest groups' demands, and by the government bending over backwards for all interest groups, no matter who they are, what they say, or what they're doing, this creates these iron triangles, and I'll show you a diagram of this in a minute here. But um, the hyperpluralist theory would say that because intergroups are trying to please every group, you get contradictory and confusing policy, and then ultimately you get gridlocked because things aren't really necessarily working. And so an example would be if the environmentalists wanted to clean air and wanted the government to impose clean air rules, the government would do that. They'd bend over backwards. They would pass laws that do that so that we have cleaner air in our um, to breathe. But if a business then, a business interest group complained that cleaning up the pollution is so expensive that it's costing their costing them money for their bottom line, the government's going to give bend over backwards for them as well, and they'll give them tax write-offs for pollution control equipment. Or if you do have, if you do do less pollution, you're going to get some type of benefit as well. So hyperpluralism just says because the government is trying to advance all interests, bending over backwards for anyone. Um, this you get contradictory and confusing policy, which basically ultimately ends up to nothing being really accomplished. You're just, you're just, you're counseling each other's policies out, and these creates these iron triangles, where these these three groups, Congress, interest groups, and bureaucracies, which are government agencies, they work together and form this triangle, which is kind of um, like a force field, and no one can get in or out and um, affect policy. Um, so Congress, if you follow the red arrow. You have Congress, who's supported by the interest groups, by their by paying money or getting their their people behind that member to get elected. They elect him into office. He he's he's a member of Congress. He's going to ultimately decide how much money is going to go to a, the bureaucracy that is going to that's going to affect that interest groups. And by them funding this bureaucracy, they're uh, also going to influence them on you know making sure that they give these this interest group whatever it may be special favors. Um, and it goes reverse in the blue lines. The Congress, the member of Congress, is going to create this, have this relationship with interest groups because they help support them, and they're going to pass friendly legislation and oversight for the interest groups. And then the interest groups is going to um, create this congressional support. By having this congressional support, they use that to lobby against bureaucracies to. Um, have policies that help help them out as well, so it creates this triangle that's that's that becomes this force field that's hard to break. Even though we have these iron triangles created by interest groups, um, the recent explosion of thousands more of interest groups developed over the over the last couple of years here, this has been seen as a weakening of the power of iron triangles. Uh, with, there, with there being so many interest groups out there to be satisfied, uh, many of the competing, many of them competing against each other, this relationship between the groups, these three groups, Congress, interest groups, bureaucracies, um, has become more difficult to sustain. So, the hyperpluralist theory of out of control interest groups being too many of them um, actually is weakening these iron triangles. All right. So, what makes an interest group successful? Um, Fortune magazine, which yearly creates this list of the 25 most powerful interest groups in politics. You can find this list on your table 11.1 .1 in your book. 
Um, it lists the top, top 25 interest groups in America, and number one is the NRA, um, which is probably an interest group most people have heard of. But then you got some other ones in here which you never may have thought would be a, a powerful interest group, like number eight is the National Beer Wholesalers Association. Um, uh, let's see here. You got number 16 is the Motion Picture Association. Number 18 is the National Right to Life Committee. Um, 22 is the Recording Industry. Um, the 25th is International Brotherhood of Teamsters, which is a union group. So there are some of these groups you never may have heard of, but um, we're going to find out what makes interest group a success so that they can be one of the top 25 interest groups in America. Okay, one of the many factors for a success, successful interest group is the size of the group itself. Um, surprisingly, the larger the group is, the more ineffective a group would be, would be compared to a small group is actually, they have a more organizational advantage over large groups. And the reason this is because of the group itself, potential group versus actual group. A potential group is the people of all the people who might be who might want to be a member. They have this this common bond or this is, they believe in the same beliefs with the, of this interest group, and they might want to be a member. So that's a potential group, the people who may want to be a group. An actual group refers to those who are actually who are in the potential group who have these common ideas and beliefs, but they actually and they actually choose to join the group. They're not just a bystander in the road. They choose to be part of the group. Um, so potential versus actual is the people who, who, who may be interested. The actual group of people actually do sign up. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this creates what's called a collective good. And collective good is something of value that cannot be withheld from their potential group. So this there's a value in whatever this group wants and this it, is, it can't be withheld from the potential group, which is the people who might want to be members. Um, members of the potential group share and benefits that members of the actual group work to secure. So, um, sorry, let me go back. The collective good is something that everybody wants in the potential group. However, the, act, the people in the actual group, they're the ones that are actually working in order to se secure this, this value, whatever this value may be that everybody may want to have. Um, and because of that, you have the actual group, the people who are actually members of the group, working harder than the potential groups, and you kind of benefit because of that, because you're just on the, the sideline benefiting from the actual group's work. And so this economist named Olson he came up with these uh, these laws. He points out that all groups are opposed to individuals, um, as opposed to all groups as opposed to individuals are in the business of providing collective goods, to something of value. They he would say that everyone in these groups are wanting something of value by being in this group. Um, the free rider problem occurs, and, so, and he said the bigger group, say also laws the bigger the bigger the group. He said that the more serious the free rider problem is, and the free rider rider problem is, is um, this occurs when potential members decide not to join, but rather sit back and let other people do the work for which they will have less benefits. So the bigger the group, the more serious the free rider problem is. The the, the the guys, the potential group members, are standing by, benefiting from everything, all the work done by the actual group. All right. So for example, unions, unions contract. They, come, they, they negotiate a contract with their employer. And the potential group probably wants to have a higher minimum wage. But the members of the actual group, the members of the union, are the ones actually working hard to try to raise the minimum wage for the, 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 the common worker in this industry, whatever the industry may be. So because of that, this, the, this, this becomes a problem for free, this becomes a free rider problem, meaning that I don't necessarily need to be involved with the union. I don't need to join the union in order to get these benefits of what the union provides for me. And so this be, this is one of the problems with having a bigger group, according to Olson. Um, the bigger the group, the more serious the free rider problem is, which is the people in the potential group just benefiting from everything going on from the actual group. So according to Olson, he would say it's easier to organize a small group with clear economic goals than it, would is to, than it is to organize a large group 
with these broader goals in mind. And smaller groups have an organizational advantage over large ones because a given member's share of the collective good, which is the value in something, in a small group may be great enough that he or she will try to secure it, but in the largest groups, each member can only expect to get a tiny share of those those policy gains that they um, receive. So the advantage of small groups helps to explain why interest groups have a hard time financially. Um, in contrast, lobbying costs and benefits for businesses are concentrated. Large corporations also enjoy inherited size advantage. Um, the small potential groups like businesses have an easier time organizing themselves for political action than large potential groups like consumers and consumers are a huge potential that's a huge group of people potential group um, so in order for a large group to overcome these overcome law Olson's laws um, they need to provide something what's called a selective benefits um, these are by joining the act by becoming a member of the actual group or this interest group that um, you're gonna get benefits that the potential group do not do not receive so usually what happens is, what it means is that you have to pay a yearly fee or due to this group, and it may include some type of publication information for you. You can get travel discounts or group rates, like group insurance rates. And this is a great example of the AARP, the American um, Association of Retired People, which is the largest interest group out there. Um, by becoming an actual group member, you benefit by joining it, then rather being on the, a potential group member who's not a member of the ARP but is a, a retired person, and you benefit from one of the policies they influence or change in government. Um, these people who are actually part of the group they receive selective benefits and um, discounts by be, by being a member. So that is, according to Olson, to get a, to to help a large group um, get away from the the problem of free riders. Um, you got to create these selective benefits in your um, within your group okay the second um, factor that um, that makes a successful interest group is the intensity um, the people's intensity within the group itself so a large way a large potential one way I'm sorry yeah one one way a large potential group can mobilize is through its issue is that the, the people feel intensely about the, the issues like abortion that's a that's um, people are very emotional when it comes to abortion so both small and large groups enjoy psychological advantage when they when intensity is involved um, politicians are more likely to listen when a group shows that it cares deep, deeply about an issue and many votes may be won or lost on that single issue and um, we've talked about this I think in the past it was mentioned I forget what chapter it was but um single issue groups which are uh, they have a very narrow interest and they don't like to compromise and they're very single-minded in their goals um, and these and whatever this whatever this interest group is it's, pro it's usually going to deal with an emotional a strong emotional um, interest like uh, nuclear power plants gun control or abortion and um, these people are going to have a, a passion and desire that's really intense that um, that may get politicians to listen to them because of their passion for it. So that could be, that's another, makes a successful interest group is the intensity of its um, policy. And the third um, factor that makes a successful interest group is financial resources. Um, so these groups, these interest groups, they distort government processes in favor of those that can raise the most money. Um, because uh, because campaigns cost so much money these days, um, interest groups who have the most more finances can uh, help raise money for these political party members who are running for office. And the more you can raise, the more um, favor you may receive once they're elected. However, conversely, um, big interests don't always win, um, even on some of the most important issues. Um, just because you 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 raise a lot of money, you help support someone to get elected, and you donated thousands and millions of dollars, may say let's say, to a party or a candidate, um, doesn't always always mean it's gonna benefit from you. Because again, there's so many interest groups out there 
just because your side is giving money, that means the the side the other side of the coin, the people against your policy, they're not they're probably just as intensely giving um, their their financial benefit as well. So they're giving money to the candidate or the party to try to make sure that it doesn't get passed. So um, it goes both ways with all these different interest groups out there. All right, so why have interest groups exploded in the past, um, let's say, I don't know, 50, 60 years? Um, so the number of interest groups have jumped from 6,000 to 22,000 from 1959 to 2,000. Um, and one of the major explosions, I'm sorry, one of the major factors in this number of uh, interest groups exploding is the development of technology and the ability to create mailing lists and the ability to rally the troops, let's say, um, has made interest groups a strong force in Washington, D.C. Um, so coordination of constituencies, activities, and efforts of lobbyists much easier, and the explosion of um, like social media, especially as well, has has made it even more easy to get your people behind and um, calling and writing and and um, protesting um, for their policy that they are in favor of. So net technology and internet has really allowed this to explode. These interest groups to become um, bigger and faster when it comes to um, making their voice heard, heard from whatever they are, whatever, Main Street or or, um, or um, Wall Street, um, you can get your voice heard to D.C. because of the internet and the te development of technology. So there are three traditional strategies of interest groups and how they shape policy. Um, they're lobbying, electioneering, and litigation. And in addition, groups have recently also developed a variety of sophisticated techniques to appeal to the public for widespread support. So these are the way that these are ways that groups try to shape policy in our government. So the first one, lobbying, which is political persuaders who represent an organized group. Um, a political persuader is a lobbyist whose job is to represent their group, their interest group, and uh, persuade members of Congress or members of um, government, any level, to pass favorable laws or policies in their favor. Um, so basically there are two types of lobbyists. Uh, you have paid, regular paid employees of a corporation, a union, or association, and the other type is a lobbyist who's for hire, someone like a, like a, uh, like lobbies, lobbies for hire would be, that's all you are, you're a lobbyist and you lobby for whatever, whoever, whatever company or organization wants to hire you for maybe a specific short time, temporary job. But then there are also ones, there are also corporations and unions that have, that's, they have full-time employees that are, that's their job is to be a lobbyist, to try to persuade um, the government to pass policies in their favor. Um, so although lobbyists primarily try to influence members of Congress, they can also be of help to them. Um, there are four ways lobbyists can help a member of Congress. Uh, the first one is source of information. Uh, members of Congress have to concern themselves with many policy areas. They don't. They can't know it all, and uh, lobbyists can help them in that when it comes to a certain area that they're a specialist in, and they provide specialized expertise. And this information and power is power. Then the lobbyists can off can often become a potent ally to a member of Congress by their um, information that they provide to them. Uh, the second way a member of Congress can be helped by lobbyists is um, political strategy. Um, lobbyists are politically savvy people and they can be useful consultants for the members of Congress um, and help them strategize how to get their policy passed through Congress and so be, again they become more of an ally and they, they build they start building these relationships with, with each other um, also um, and the third one is get the group's members behind a politician um, for instance like the labor union leaders um, they can provide help in how to appeal to a typical working the typical working people and often to provide members of Congress volunteers to help out campaigns as well. And, and by doing this, you're going to get, uh, especially like labor union type type um, interest groups, which has a lot large groups of people, 
these people are going to get behind you and they may they're going to vote help vote help vote you into office again um, the fourth way a lobbyist can help member of congress is a source of ideas and and innovations uh, lobbyists can introduce bills they cannot introduce bills sorry they cannot introduce bills but they can peddle their ideas to politicians who are eager to attach their name to any idea that will bring them political credit again they specialize in a certain area um, with this information and and also they can give them ideas how to promote this policy especially if it's going to help give them um, some credibility with voters and help get them more votes to be uh, re-elected into office. Um, so these are the four ways that a lobbyist can uh, help a member of Congress. However, um, some political scientists are not always in agreement about how effective lobbying is. Um, much evidence suggests that lobbyists' as power over policy is often exaggerated and there's a lot of ev evidence out there that suggests that lobbying can sometimes persuade legislators to support a certain policy. Um, for example, um, opposition to gun control legislation by the NRA, National Rifle Association, and the intensive lobbying against the 1988 Catastrophic Health Care Act conducted by the nation's most wealthy senior citizens. Um, these interest groups strongly you know, were for or against these, were, were formally against these different type of policies, and they leaned heavily on these members of Congress, which can, in, which have in the, in the past um, made them sway how they vote. But um, it's difficult to speculate how effective lobbying is because it's hard to um, isolate these effects from other influences like um, campaigning, um, how much, who's don who don donates what. So it's kind of hard to tell how effective these lobbying techniques are on to members of Congress. Um, the second way groups try to shape policy is electioneering. So this is aiding candidates financially uh, when it comes to elections and getting them, their members to support them. Um, getting the right people into office or keeping them there is a key strategy of interest groups. And many groups, therefore, get involved in the election aspect of politics. And one way they do this is through PACs or political action committees. Uh, they provide a means for groups to participate in electionary elections um, more than ever before. In recent years, um, nearly half of the candidates running for a re-election to, to House of Representatives or the Senate or even the presidency, even now, even the pres also the presidency, they receive majority of their campaign funds from PACs or political action committees. Um, and all political action committees are really are they're interest groups that are trying to elect a person into office and they raise money to help pay for that election and that's their job they're trying to get get um, that person there but they're supporting um, into office where just a lobbyist they're trying to persuade members of Congress to um, pass policies when it comes to laws in their favor so there's a difference between PACs political action committees and lobbyists um, their goals are a little bit different so, you know, it's, again, you need, PACs are huge, um, are big time nowadays, even more so, um, to try to help people get elected. For the most part, they need, people running for office need PACs to back them to uh, help pay for their elections because it's so expensive these days. And the third, I need a number of these, but the third um, way groups try to shape policy is litigation. It's through litigation. Um, this is often used if interest groups fail to, um, get anything done in Congress, um, or they only get a vague piece of legislation passed. Uh, for example, I'm sorry, let me go back. Um, environmental legislation like the Clean Air Act typically, typically includes written provisions allowing ordinary citizens to sue for enforcement. And this constant threat of lawsuit increases the likelihood that businesses were will consider the environmental impact of what they do when they're building something just because they're fearful that people suing them. Um, they're going to go through the expensive and lengthy process of figuring out what's what the impact is going to have on the environment just whenever they're, whatever they're, they're, they're building. Um, so some tactics and strategies interest groups use when it comes to litigation is um, one is the amicus carrier briefs which is which is friend of the court in Latin these are written arguments submitted to the courts in support of uh, one side of the case or the other. And what happens, the judges read these 
Amicus Curia, Curiae briefs, and um, they could be influential in some way or the other, either for or against it. And the other way they use these they use tactic strategies in litigation is through class action lawsuits. Um, this is a more direct judicial strategy employed by interest groups, uh, which enables a group of similar situated plaintiffs to combine their their grievances or their complaints into a single suit and using that that pow power of number number of people that power to shape policy that way by getting things overturned or changed so the last one is going public the last way they try to shape public, public, public policy is by going to the public themselves having a good image is a good thing when you're trying to get the publics behind you um, the practice of the practice of interest groups appealing to the public for support has a long tradition in American politics, and when it comes to election time, election day, you're going to see PAC groups putting out commercials for or against um, political candidates or for or against different policies. Like when the health care bill was being debated, there was there was hundreds, I don't know hundreds, but there were, there were a lot of different um, political ads on TV for or against it, and those are all paid by these different interest groups, either PACs or um, some interest group that has a has a um, like a health interest group out there, doctors or nurses or something like that. AARP was out there actually putting out commercials as well, trying to shape the image of the law or the policy or maybe a political candidate in order to um, get support for it or against it. So that's those are the four ways that groups try to shape public policy. Now we're going to look at the types of interest groups, the most common, um, according to political scientists who categorize these interest groups into four main policy areas. So the first policy area, or the first type of interest groups are economic groups. And economic groups are going to be concerned with wages, uh, prices, and profits for their uh, companies or, um, or employees, employers. Uh, so that's what they deal in main with. And um, the American economy, in the American economy, government doesn't really directly determine these factors, but more commonly, public policy in America has, has an economic effect through regulations from government, through tax advantages given by the government, through subsidies or contracts by the government. So even though they don't directly determine these factors, they indirectly do it through uh, regulations, taxes, subsidies, and contracts. Um, Two different types of economic groups. You have the labor interest groups. These are people who work, like blue collar people. Um, they're these uh, labors. Labor has a more affiliated members. They have more affiliated members than the other interest groups. Um, for example, the AFL CIO. It's a itself is a union of unions. It's a bunch of different unions that come together and become an Uber union. So. Labor unions, they fight for union shops, which would be laws that are policy that require new employees to join their union in order to work there. Um, they must join a union. So that's some of the things that labor unions would fight for. And then you have business laborers, I'm sorry, business unions, uh, business interest groups who are, who's going to fight for the opposite, which is right to work laws, which we have here in Nevada. But um, right to work laws say that you don't have to be a member of a union in order to be employed. Um, so like this Clark County, Clark County School District, for example, they have a union, and I don't. if I were to teach at a, the county school, I wouldn't have to join the union in order to work there. I, I could join the union. I'd become an actual group member instead of a potential group member, but um, um, right to work laws is they allow you to join or jo have join. Um, become become employed even though you don't have to join their their union. And so, what a business interest group would be would they would try to promote greater profits for the business, tax benefits, and subsidies and and contracts from government. Okay, the second type of interest groups would be environmental groups. Um, environmental groups became a uh, became a big time organization when it came when it became when um. The supply of energy and the destruction of the supply of energy became apparent in America. 
So they've um, ex they've exerted a great deal of influence in Congress because of uh, um, the, the impact the environment has due to our our destruction to it. Um, so they're going to so environmentalists. They're they they would say that energy supplies can be insured without harming the environment or risking radiation. Um, then you have the energy producer interest groups who are going to try to promote the fact that you there's going to be have to be there's going to have to be some risk when it comes to fulfilling energy demand. So you have these two different interest groups within within environmental groups fighting for policies to favor them. And the third type of interest groups is the equality groups. Um, these type of interest groups are going to be representing women and minorities. Um, basically, they're going to try to fight for equality at the polls, housing, job, education, and any other um, inequality type issues. Uh, this is the dominant way that African American groups like the NA NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, won many victories when it comes to equality through their... Uh, protests and and um, boycotts um, they're able to change the equality rules and laws in America um, and then you got the women you know like 19th Amendment getting passed um, guaranteeing for the right to vote for women the fourth type of interest group is consumers and the public interest groups they represent so public interest lo lobbyists or interest groups they're trying to be, they're trying to they're trying to represent the public when it comes to an idea or cause they would that's going to represent everyone in America um, there are organizations that seek a collective good by which everyone a value that's the value by which everyone should be better off regardless of whether they joined in the lobbying or not that's kind of like health care people would public interest groups say that it, it's better for the public's interest if we had mandated health care um, regardless if you join or not this group. So you have consumer lobbyists who try to who lobby and make sure that you the consumer is protected when it comes to products made by businesses and you got some other type out there for people who don't have a voice like children, advocates, animal advocates, mentally ill advocates. These are all different interest groups that are um, for the public or consumers trying to protect them and keep them safe from um, different industries out there. Okay, understanding interest groups. Um, when it comes to interest groups and democracy, um, the problem of interest groups is America in America today it remains much the same as when James Madison defined it back 200 years ago, 220 plus years ago. Um, a free society must allow for the representation of all groups, yet groups are usually more concerned with their own interest, self-interest, than the needs of the society as a whole. So for democracy to work well, it's important that self-interested groups not to be allowed to assume a dominant position. So when it comes to democracy and interest groups, um, the problem is they're self-interested and you need to make sure they're not dominant. Um, Madison's solution was to create an open system in which many groups would be able to participate and because of that, um, groups with opposing interests would counterbalance each other. That was his solution to interest groups or, or uh, factions. Um, the pluralist theorists, though, believe that a rough approximation of public interest groups emerges from this competition. So interest groups come because of this competition is um, of all these different groups out there. Elitist theory theorists would point to the the expansion of business packs as evidence that more interest groups corrupt have been uh, more interest groups there are the more corrupt American politics has been than ever and um, the wealthiest interest groups are generally have a greater advantage um, because of this system that we've created and then the hyper pluralist when it comes to uh, interest groups and democracy they maintain that whenever a majority interest group objects strongly to proposed legislation policymakers will bend over backwards to try to accommodate them and they would argue that this behavior has made it increasingly difficult to accomplish major policy change and has thus led to policy gridlock. So not, nothing gets really done. So interest groups are, um, they represent all groups. They're however self-interested. Um, one can't, we, don't, we can't have one become a dominant 
dominant interest group. So Madison suggested having open system, but because of this openness, you have these three different theories out there. Um, interest groups and the scope of government. Basically, what how is the interest group affected the size of government? Um, the power of special interest groups has impacted the scope or size of government. Um, interest groups strive to establish programs that benefit them because they're self interested, self promoting, and this has promoted prom this pre because of this. This promotes government with a broader scope or size. Um, and the growth of government can also be attributed to the increase of interest groups, which has allowed the government to become more involved. So when it comes to interest groups in the scope of government, um, the more there are, the more benefits this, they promote. This, promote. this prompts the government to be more involved in our lives. And um, has it, the increasing numbers of interest groups has allowed the government to become bigger as well. So there you go, chapter 11, interest groups.